Daddy, the girl in the trunk is asking to be let out, our five-year-old daughter said during a quiet family drive. Her innocent voice cut through the silence, making my heart skip a beat. I turned to my husband, trying to read his reaction. His face, which had been calm a moment ago, turned pale. I couldn't tell if he was trying to play dumb or was genuinely frightened by her words. He glanced back at our daughter through the rearview mirror, his eyes wide with fear. That's a scary thing to say, he muttered, trying to dismiss it. You shouldn't tell such lies. I glared at him from the passenger seat, feeling a knot of suspicion tightening in my chest. Maybe we should pull over at the rest area, I suggested, my voice sharper than I intended. It had been six years since we got married. I had always been supportive of my husband, even though his job kept him busy. I had been the one holding things together at home, managing everything while he focused on his career. But now, with our daughter's strange words hanging in the air, I felt a chill of uncertainty. Was something dark about to be revealed? My name is Lisa Jackson. I married my husband, James, when I was 30 years old. He is five years older than me, and our relationship had always seemed solid. The year after we got married, our daughter Julia was born, bringing so much joy into our lives. She's been growing up healthy and lively, and just recently turned five. Our family had been living busy but happy days, filled with love and laughter. How about going to the zoo next Friday? James suggested, trying to change the mood. Yay! I want to see the giraffes. Julia squealed with excitement, her earlier comment seemingly forgotten. I couldn't help but smile at their cheerful conversation, feeling a bit of the tension ease away. James had always been a kind and loving husband. Since we started dating, he was attentive and caring, and that didn't change after we got married and had Julia. On his days off, he would eagerly join in on family activities, playing with Julia and making her laugh. He was the perfect father, always there for us. I often thought about how lucky I was to have married him. Watching James and Julia together brought me a deep sense of happiness. Our life was good, stable, and filled with love. But little did I know, those peaceful days were about to be shattered. One day, James came home with a heavy sigh, his face looking weary and troubled. You're being transferred to a different department. I asked, noticing his downcast expression. Yeah, he replied, his voice flat. It's company policy. They want me to gain experience in different places. His words felt like the first crack in our happy life. I didn't know why, but something about this transfer made me uneasy. I could sense that there was more to the story, something James wasn't telling me, and as our daughter's strange words echoed in my mind, I couldn't shake the feeling that our lives were about to change in ways I couldn't imagine. James was being transferred to the busiest department in his company, which meant he might not be able to spend as much time with us. The news hit our family hard, especially Julia. Daddy, are you not going to play with me anymore? She asked, her big eyes filled with worry. James, trying his best to reassure her, gently stroked her hair and said, I'll do my best to spend as much time with you as possible, Julia. Let's go to the zoo again sometime soon. Despite his comforting words, I could see the regret in his expression. He knew this transfer was going to change things for us, and the thought of it weighed heavily on his mind. As I watched him with our daughter, a tightness grew in my chest, overwhelmed with emotions. The transfer didn't involve a change in salary or require us to move, but it was still a big deal for our family. Just the thought of having less time together made me feel incredibly lonely. However, I knew the one feeling the most vulnerable was James. Adjusting to a new, more demanding environment would be tough for him. Please don't push yourself too hard, I said, trying to hide the worry in my voice. I knew James had a tendency to throw himself fully into his work, sometimes to the point of exhaustion. That's why I worried about him overdoing it, and unfortunately, my concerns turned out to be justified. At first, James managed to balance his work and home life. He still made time for family activities and found moments to rest, despite his busier schedule. 
but about a month after the transfer, everything changed. His time at home decreased dramatically. He started working overtime, often coming home late at night, long after Julia had gone to bed. It became more common for him to go out for drinks with clients, and he even began working on his days off. But there was something else that concerned me even more. One day, I cautiously asked him, Hey, can you take a day off next Friday? Julia misses you, and you've been working too hard lately. James looked at me with a tired, frustrated expression. Who do you think I'm working so hard for? Should I just turn down client meetings and risk getting fired? He snapped. I quickly replied, I didn't mean it like that. I'm just worried about you. That's none of your business, he muttered, brushing me off. Anyway, make sure you have money ready for next week's drinking party. His words stung, and I could see how much the stress was affecting him. James, who had always been kind and patient, was now irritable and short-tempered. He started taking out his frustrations on me more frequently, and I found myself walking on eggshells around him. What worried me even more was how he was spending money extravagantly, claiming it was necessary for entertaining clients. This new habit was beginning to impact our living expenses, adding financial stress to an already tense situation. Because I knew how kind he used to be, I was more worried than angry about his current behavior. It was clear to me that the pressure of his new job was getting to him, and I feared he was going to collapse from overwork if things didn't change. I felt helpless, not knowing how to make things better for him or for our family. As the months passed, James's situation only worsened. Five months after his transfer, he reached a point where he was coming home mostly just to sleep. Our conversations became brief, and the connection we once had felt distant. Julia, feeling the absence of her father, started to show signs of sadness. She often wore a forlorn expression, missing the time they used to spend together. Seeing her like that broke my heart. I knew we couldn't go on like this. I needed to find a way to help James before his relentless work schedule took an even bigger toll on our family. But I didn't know where to start, and the weight of it all was becoming too much to bear. I knew things couldn't go on like this, so I started trying to figure out a way for James to take a break. He was clearly overwhelmed, and our family was suffering because of it. But just as I was beginning to make plans, more bad things started to happen, almost as if the universe was working against us. The worst blow came when my mother, who had been battling an illness for several years, suddenly passed away in the hospital. The moment I heard the news, it felt like the ground had been pulled out from under me. No, Mom, I whispered, tears streaming down my face. My father had died when I was young so my mother was the only parent I had left. Losing her felt like losing the last piece of my childhood. I couldn't even have a proper conversation with her before she passed away, and that regret weighed heavily on me. When the call came, I was at home, and I was so shocked that I couldn't move for a while. I just stood there, frozen, as the realization hit me that she was really gone. But what hurt even more was James's reaction. When I told him about my mother's passing, his response was unbelievably cold. Hey, do I have to go to that funeral too? He asked, his voice completely devoid of sympathy. I stared at him, my eyes wide with disbelief. Yes, the relationship between James and my mother might have been distant, but she was still his mother-in-law. She was family. I couldn't understand how he could be so indifferent, especially at a time like this. What are you saying? Of course, you have to go, I replied, trying to keep my voice steady. It's a family funeral. Don't get mad at me, he muttered, rolling his eyes. Ah, oh, why does this have to happen now? I had plans too. His words cut through me like a knife. In the past, James would have comforted me, perhaps by rubbing my back and grieving with me together. But now, as he sighed in dissatisfaction, he seemed like a completely different person from the one I had promised to spend my life with. Naturally, he didn't help with any of the preparations for my mother's funeral. I arranged everything alone, feeling more isolated than ever. On the day of the service, James remained silent and sullen. 
He didn't offer any support or comfort, and after the funeral ended, he simply said, It's over now, right? I'm heading home first, and left without helping with the cleanup. I was initially confused by his reaction, but by then, I had lost the energy to be angry. I was simply bewildered and deeply disappointed in him. No matter how busy or stressed he was from work, his behavior at the funeral was unacceptable. When did my husband become such a cold person? Despite feeling frustrated with him, I finished cleaning up with Julia by my side. She was too young to understand everything that was happening, but she could sense that something was wrong and did her best to help me. Mom, Julia will help you, she said, her small voice bringing a bit of comfort to my aging heart. After the funeral, I decided to stop by my parents' house for a short while. It wasn't far from our home, and I wanted to say a final goodbye to the place that held so many memories of my mother. Although it was a sad visit, I felt it was something I needed to do for my own peace of mind. When I arrived at my parents' house with a heavy heart, I took a deep breath and walked inside. The house felt empty, a shell of what it used to be. As I stood in the living room, Surrounded by the remnants of my mother's life, I felt a wave of sorrow wash over me. But before I could even begin to process my feelings, something unexpected happened. Mom, wait a moment. Julia suddenly shouted, her voice filled with urgency. Huh, Julia, what's wrong? I asked, startled by her sudden change in behavior. As soon as we arrived at my parents' house, Julia's expression had shifted dramatically. Without another word, she dashed straight into the back room, leaving me standing there, puzzled and concerned. I quickly followed her, my heart pounding with a mix of anxiety and confusion, wondering what could have caused her to react like this. I had taken Julia to visit my mother's place several times before, but I had never seen her act like this. Curious and concerned, I hurried to follow her as she moved with a sense of purpose. Julia stopped in front of the dresser, her small hands reaching for the second drawer from the bottom. It was as if something was drawing her to it. Mom, Grandma wants you to have this, she said, holding up an old hand mirror. The sight of the mirror took my breath away. It was an item that had always been precious to my mother. She cherished it so much that she rarely used it, and I didn't even know where she kept it. I stood there, stunned, as I realized that Julia had somehow found this hidden treasure. How did you know it was here? And what do you mean, Grandma wanted me to have it? I asked, my voice tinged with disbelief. When Grandma was sleeping earlier, she told me that you were sad and asked me to give this to you. Julia answered innocently, her eyes wide with sincerity. I couldn't hide my surprise. Her words sent a chill down my spine. There was no way Julia could have known about the existence of this hand mirror, let alone where it was kept. Yet here she was, holding it out to me with a calm certainty that was both unsettling and awe-inspiring. Wanting to understand what was happening, I decided to ask her some questions. I asked about things she couldn't possibly know. Tomorrow's dinner menu I was thinking about, and even thoughts I had during the funeral. To my astonishment, Julia answered each question correctly, as if she had read my mind. It became clear to me that my daughter had a mysterious ability to know what people were thinking. I was both amazed and bewildered. Wow, that's amazing, Julia. You know everything, I said, stroking her head gently, still trying to wrap my mind around this revelation. I had always thought that the idea of mysterious abilities was just something from stories, never imagining that my own daughter might possess such a power. Julia, proud of her newfound ability, put her hand on her hip and gave me a confident look. That's right. Julia knows about Dad, too. What do you mean? I asked, my heart skipping a beat. What she told me next was incredibly unbelievable and unforgivable. Julia revealed things about James that shook me to my core. I listened in stunned silence as she spoke, realizing that the man I had married was not who I thought he was. A few weeks after my mother's funeral, I decided it was time to confront James. On a morning when he was getting ready to leave for work, I casually mentioned, by the way, 
I'm visiting my friend with Julia next Friday. James, who had been focused on getting out the door, suddenly stopped in his tracks. He frowned, looking genuinely troubled. Really? Oh no, I'm off that day. That's too bad, he said, his voice filled with artificial concern. I could sense the insincerity in his tone. It was clear to me now that he was hiding something. I let out a small, knowing smile, careful not to reveal my true feelings. Now that I knew the truth, there was no love left for James inside me. That Friday, I left home with Julia as planned. We spent about an hour away, giving me time to gather my thoughts and prepare for what I needed to do. When we returned home, Julia pointed towards the garage and said, Dad's over there. I took a deep breath and walked towards the garage, where the shutter was still down. My heart was pounding, but I knew what had to be done. I lightly knocked on the shutter and called out, James, I know you're in there. Open it. There was a moment of silence, then a hesitant voice replied, Huh? Lisa? I thought you and Julia had plans, James said, his voice filled with surprise. It's cancelled, I replied calmly. If you're going somewhere, we want to come with you. He sounded flustered and hesitant, clearly not expecting this. Oh, okay, he stammered, reluctant to open the garage shutter. I had a pretty good idea of what was going on inside, but decided to stay quiet and observe. Julia wants to go for a drive too, I added, hearing the hope in her voice. Unable to resist, James had no choice but to agree. A few minutes later, he reluctantly opened the garage, and we started our drive together. Sitting in the passenger seat, I looked at James as he drove. His profile was tense and it solidified my final decision. Life with James had been enjoyable and happy, but I knew those days would never come back. Hey, did you know Julia has a special power? I finally brought it up as we merged onto the highway. James furrowed his brows, confused by my sudden confession. Huh, what's that supposed to mean? That's a silly joke, he laughed dismissively. Daddy, the girl in the trunk is asking you to let her out. Julia suddenly raised her voice from the back seat. I watched as James's face turned pale. He glanced at our daughter through the rearview mirror with a frightened expression. What a scary thing to say. You shouldn't tell such lies, he said nervously. But it's true, Julia insisted. Then should we pull over at the rest area? I suggested, trying to support Julia's claim. James immediately looked at me, startled. Huh, we don't need to do that. It's just a kid's joke, he said, trying to brush it off. Julia has a mysterious power, you know. Besides, it's hot today and it could be dangerous if someone's really in there. He must have thought my suggestion made sense. After flinching and stiffening, he reluctantly headed towards the rest area with a contorted expression on his face. Upon arrival, we left Julia in the air-conditioned car and went outside to check the trunk. I don't think there's anything in there. Come on, quickly, I urged James, who was hesitating. Realizing he couldn't escape anymore, James nervously opened the trunk, breaking into a cold sweat. In the next moment, a young woman jumped out her face flushed red from the heat. I knew you were cheating. I shouted, my suspicions confirmed. The young woman, looking embarrassed and uncomfortable, stood there while James shook, shook his head nervously. No, it's not like that. She is a colleague from work. We were just working together, he stammered, trying to explain. Wow, working in the trunk of our car? I retorted sarcastically. At the new apartment you're doing a job? James's excuses were pathetic and unbelievable. It turned out that while Julia and I were out, James had been cheating with this woman at home. They were about to go for a drive when we returned unexpectedly, so he had no choice but to hide her in the trunk. As the woman was taken away, James seemed unable to grasp the situation fully. He kept trying to come up with more excuses, but I wasn't listening anymore. I knew our marriage was over. The trust and love we once had were gone, replaced by betrayal and lies. I looked at Julia, who was watching everything quietly from the car. I knew I had to be strong for her, 
to move on and build a new life without James. I laughed at how ridiculous James's lie was, standing my ground as I pulled out a piece of paper from my bag. And what is this? I asked, showing him the paper. It read, let's go on a drive date on Friday. James and the woman, Janice, turned pale when they saw it. It was no surprise they could see their flirty email exchanges printed right there. Thanks to Julia, I had found out everything. On the day of my mother's funeral at my parents' house, my daughter had told me, Daddy has been spending a lot of time with Janice lately. I'm sad because Janice is taking Daddy away from me. After witnessing Julia's strange ability to know things, I became suspicious and decided to keep an eye on James. Sure enough, I found undeniable proof of his affair on his phone. So I had made up the fake plan to catch him in the act. It's a shame this drive turned out this way, I said sarcastically. It's unfair to look through my phone without permission. James protested, his body tense as he reacted to my words. His absurd remark made me burst into laughter. I had thought he was just busy with work, but it turned out he was spending time with Janice, using our money for their dates. Who exactly is being unfair here? I shot back. By the way, I've been recording everything since we got into the car. Remembering all the wrongs James had done, I pulled out my phone from my pocket. I had secretly pressed the record button to capture everything, and the evidence I had wasn't just messages and this video. I also set up hidden cameras in our house and garage. And Janice, I know everything about you too. Under my relentless confrontation, they both turned white as sheets. I was furious with James, but I couldn't forgive Janice either. I had thoroughly investigated my husband and figured out who she was. Janice was a 27-year-old new employee who worked with James in his new department. From the messages, it was clear she knew about me, yet she still went ahead with the affair, making her just as guilty. Oh, uh, sorry, Lisa. James whimpered, clearly not expecting to be cornered so perfectly. His pitiful attempt to plead with me only filled me with more disgust. I glared at both of them with all the anger I could muster. I won't forgive either of you. Get ready to pay alimony. Hearing my firm words, and perhaps realizing their fate, both of them collapsed to their knees. After that, I divorced James. The fact that I had recorded everything and gathered all the evidence paid off. They were ordered to pay $500,000 in compensation. I was also able to get $1,000 a month in child support from my husband. But their troubles didn't stop there. I heard that news of their affair spread throughout the whole company, especially since they worked in the same department. This made things very uncomfortable for them, and eventually, they broke up. Their coworkers started to disapprove of them, and in the end, they had no choice but to resign. Now, I've heard they're struggling with the burden of the compensation payments and are left with nothing. Meanwhile, I'm enjoying peaceful days with Julia. I'm focused on giving her lots of love and support, knowing she has a special gift. I want to make sure she grows up happy and well taken care of. My name is Sharon, and by profession, I am an architect. However, on this significant day, I found myself taking on the role of a bride, eagerly making my way down the aisle. I had put my heart and soul into organizing every aspect of our wedding, from the choice of flowers to the playlist that would provide our soundtrack for the evening. I envisioned our special day as if it were lifted from the pages of a romance novel, a testament to the power of love. Standing at the altar was Peter, my soon-to-be husband who works as an engineer. His approach to life is pragmatic and direct, perfectly balancing my creative instincts. I always felt that we were a great match, enhancing each other's strengths. The excitement of beginning a new chapter with him filled me with joy. However, as our gazes met, I couldn't help but notice a distant, burdened look in his eyes. I attributed it to wedding day jitters. Little did I know, I was mistaken. As I walked closer, I overheard Peter's mother, Julie, whispering to someone next to her. Her scrutinizing look made me uneasy, but she managed a strained smile and told me I looked beautiful, though her eyes told a different story. The ceremony moved forward, 
and when it was time for Peter to speak his vows, there was a heart-stopping pause before he managed to say, I do. His voice lacked the warmth I had come to associate with his affection for me. During the ring exchange, Julie made it a point to take a photo, loudly stating the importance of capturing the moment. Her words, though seemingly innocent, felt more like a veiled warning than a celebration of our commitment. At the reception, Julie found me mingling with some college friends and commented on my wedding dress with a thinly veiled critique, praising its beauty yet highlighting its non-traditional nature. I responded with a lighthearted remark about celebrating love in our unique way. Before the conversation could go further, Peter stepped in, asking his mother to give us space. For a moment, I thought he was defending our choices, but his comment hinted at resignation rather than support. His words felt out of place on a day that was meant to be filled with nothing but happiness. I scanned the crowd, hoping to lock eyes with someone who might confirm that what I was experiencing was just typical wedding day chaos. Yet deep inside, I knew better. There was a palpable tension, an undeniable sense that something fundamental was amiss, and the red flags were too prominent to overlook any longer. As Peter and I stepped onto the dance floor for our first dance, the distance between us was more than just physical. Our movements were in sync, but emotionally, we were worlds apart. The song, intended as a celebration of our union, felt more like a cruel joke. When the music faded, Peter's attempt at reassurance only emphasized the void between us. So, Mrs. Sharon, ready for forever? He asked. The irony of his question weighed heavily on me. I wanted to voice my doubts to question if all our tomorrows would be shadowed by the unease of today. Instead, I masked my concerns with a tentative affirmation, hoping against hope that the gloom would dissipate and that this rocky beginning was not a foretaste of what was to come. I was unaware that this day would merely serve as the overture to a challenging period that would test not only the resilience of our marriage, but the essence of my identity. As we celebrated our union, the festive toasts felt hollow, overshadowed by a sense of loss. The journey back to my home, a charming three-bedroom house that stood as a testament to my hard work and independence, marked the beginning of our shared life. This home was meant to be our haven, the foundation for our future together. Yet, it soon became the backdrop for a series of confrontations that felt more like an invasion than the start of marital bliss. Julie, living a mere quarter of an hour away, took to visiting uninvited with unsettling frequency. Her criticisms were relentless, targeting everything from my culinary skills to the decor of our home. Her complaints were varied but equally cutting, whether lamenting my tasteless cooking or the choice of bathroom tile color. Peter's attempts to intervene were tepid at best, often seeming more performative than protective. Julie's intrusions became a regular ordeal, each visit an opportunity to assert her dominance through thinly veiled insults and critiques. However, the real turning point came one afternoon when she arrived with suitcases in tow, her declaration of intent clear and her sense of entitlement palpable. This was not just another visit. It was an occupation, one that threatened to suffocate the life out of our nascent marriage. I'm going to be living here now, she announced, breezing past me to place her luggage in my favorite cozy corner by the window, my sanctuary for reading and quiet moments. This spot will be just perfect for me, Julie proclaimed with a finality that made my heart drop. I turned to Peter, my eyes wide with disbelief, silently begging him to intervene, to preserve the sanctity of our home. This was a decision we should have made together. Seizing a moment, I called Peter aside, my voice shaking. This is our home. Shouldn't we have talked about this first? His gaze met mine, void of the warmth and love that had once seemed so abundant. Mom's getting older, Sharon. It's not right for her to be alone. She needs to be with family, he explained stressing the word family in a way that made me feel excluded. So, I'm not family. Is that it? The words barely left my lips before the tears began to well up, a mix of hurt and frustration, Peter quickly countered, his patience thinning. You know, that's not what I mean. But I owe her this. What about us? 
what about what we owe to each other? We're supposed to be building our life together, not living with your mom, I argued, but it was as if I was speaking to a wall. My concerns, my feelings, seemed inconsequential. And just like that, Julie's move into our home was decided, steamrolling over my wishes. With Julie's arrival, the dynamic of our home shifted drastically. Every corner of the house, once filled with our shared dreams and plans, now felt weighed down by tension and conflict. My once peaceful reading nook was overtaken by her belongings. The kitchen became a stage for her critiques, and Peter, the man I had married, seemed more like an ally to Julie than to me. It dawned on me that I was no longer just fighting to save my marriage or reclaim my space. I was fighting for my very sense of self, my dignity, and my peace. A persistent thought haunted me. How had things come to this point, where my desires, my space, and my voice were secondary to Julie's preferences? The transformation was stark. My beloved nook was now a monument to Julie's intrusion, the kitchen a battleground for her relentless criticism, and my husband had become a stranger, aligning himself with what felt like the opposition. And this was only the beginning. Life, already challenging, became an unbearable nightmare as the atmosphere in our home grew increasingly oppressive, symbolizing the shrinking of my own space and voice. To add to the mounting pressure, a discovery brought everything into sharper focus, the unmistakable presence of two blue lines on a pregnancy test, signaling a new life amidst the turmoil. This revelation intensified the situation, making the already dense atmosphere in the house almost suffocating as I grappled with the realization that the stakes were now even higher. Clutching the pregnancy test, my hands shook with a mixture of anticipation and dread. I had always dreamt that discovering I was pregnant would be one of the happiest moments of my life, a time filled with excitement and celebration. However, standing alone in the bathroom, tears welling up in my eyes as I faced my reflection, I realized this milestone felt more like a heavy burden. When I shared the news with Peter, his reaction was disappointingly tepid. Well, that's something, he muttered, quickly diverting the conversation to a renovation idea his mother had proposed. It became clear that Julie saw my pregnancy not just as news, but as her new project. She took it upon herself to oversee every aspect of it, from what I ate to where I would give birth, all under the guise of being helpful. Julie's interference quickly escalated into a form of control. She scrutinized everything I ate, casting judgmental glances at even the simplest of meals and questioning my weight management, despite my assurances that my diet was doctor-approved. Doctors these days have no clue, she'd scoff dismissively, convinced that her dated wisdom surpassed modern medical advice. As the pregnancy progressed, Julie's demands grew more outrageous. She transformed my home into her domain, expecting me to maintain it to her standards, disregarding the fact that I was pregnant and needed rest. Sharon, why isn't the living room clean yet? She would demand from her spot in my once peaceful reading nook, now commandeered as her base for endless phone scrolling and TV watching. My protests of fatigue fell on deaf ears, with Julie insisting that pregnancy was no excuse for laziness. Peter's silence throughout these exchanges only added to the strain. His lack of support became painfully obvious, especially during a dinner that erupted into an argument over baby names. Julie's harsh criticism of my chosen name was the last straw. Enough, Julie. This is my child, and I will decide how to raise them, I countered, my patience exhausted. Her reaction was one of indignation, as if my asserting some control over my own life was a personal affront. Peter's attempt at peacemaking, siding with his mother and labeling me as emotional, only deepened the chasm between us. I was left feeling more isolated than ever, trapped in a home that had become a battleground, where my voice seemed to matter less and less. This wasn't just about choosing a baby name anymore. It was about reclaiming my autonomy, my dignity, and the sense of belonging that had been systematically eroded by Julie's overbearing presence. Gazing into the reflection of my once shiny wedding ring, I hardly recognized the woman looking back at me. A woman who was gradually losing everything she held dear, 
her sanctuary, her self-respect, and most heartbreakingly, her determination to stand up for herself. It was during one of our tense confrontations that Julie, brimming with a vindictive sense of victory, delivered a blow that would alter everything. She coldly suggested that perhaps I didn't belong in their family if I couldn't navigate a simple family disagreement. Peter's response, or lack thereof, was perhaps the most painful part. His silence was louder and more hurtful than any words could ever be, making it painfully clear that my ordeal was not just beginning, it had been my reality for far too long. My days turned into a blur, moving through a house that no longer felt like mine, clinging to the only beacon of hope I had left the life growing inside me. Yet even this small comfort felt under siege in the toxic environment I found myself in. The breaking point came one frigid evening during yet another excruciating family dinner. Despite my efforts to prepare a flawless meal, Julie's criticisms were relentless, attacking everything from the food seasoning to its preparation. Her words felt like physical blows, each comment a strike against my already wavering confidence. But it was her next jab that cut the deepest questioning my capability as a mother based on my supposed inadequacy in managing household chores. Peter's agreement with her was the final blow, pushing me over the edge. Fueled by a mix of anger, accumulated resentment, and sheer desperation, I found my voice. Step it up? I've been carrying our child, taking care of our home, and enduring endless criticism from your mother. And you're telling me to step it up? The shock on their faces said it all, but I was past caring. For too long, I had allowed myself to be diminished and belittled. But in that moment, I reclaimed my voice. I'm done. I can't do this anymore, I declared, the clarity of my decision piercing through the years of suppression. It was a declaration of my refusal to tolerate any more disrespect or emotional torment. I was ready to fight for myself, for my child, and for a future free from the shadows that had darkened my life. My voice broke as I spoke. I refuse to raise my child in a place where their mother is constantly belittled. If this is what being a family means to you, then I want no part in it. With those final words, I left the dinner table behind their stunned silence echoing in my wake. Grabbing only the essentials, I made my way to the door, my hands trembling as I reached for the knob, eager to escape the suffocating atmosphere. Julie, ever the antagonist, chose that moment for her most cutting remark yet. And where do you think you're going? This is Peter's house, not yours. I stopped and faced her, my resolve hardening. Actually, Julie, this house is mine. I bought it. I decide who stays and who goes. Peter's voice broke through, tinged with desperation. Sharon, please, let's discuss this. But I was beyond negotiation. There's nothing left to discuss, I replied, my tears a testament to the pain of my decision. Stepping out into the cold night felt like stepping into a new chapter of my life, one filled with uncertainty, but also a sense of liberation. The door closing behind me signified the end of a tumultuous saga, a final farewell to a life I could no longer bear. I walked away, each step a mixture of pain and determination, propelled by the need to reclaim my autonomy. The journey to my parents' home was a blur of cold, fatigue, and heartache. Just a short distance from my haven, a misstep caused me to stumble and fall, the physical pain a mere echo of my inner turmoil. Yet this fall did not deter me. It only strengthened my resolve. Reaching my parents' doorstep, the concern in their eyes mirrored the gravity of my situation. As they ushered me to the hospital, I realized that this moment of vulnerability marked not just an end, but a beginning. Lying in the hospital bed with the reality of my circumstances setting in, I understood that returning to my previous life was not an option. This breaking point was a crucial step towards reclaiming the life and dignity that had been eroded away, a painful yet essential transition towards healing and independence. The clarity that comes with such moments is profound, revealing the path forward, away from the shadows of the past towards a future of my own making. 
Caught in a whirlwind of emotions, I stood surrounded by the comforting yet worried presence of my parents. Their concern was palpable, a silent testament to their fears about the true state of my marriage, now unmistakably revealed in its troubled depth. Breaking the heavy silence, my mom voiced her concern, her words heavy with the weight of the unfolding reality. Sharon, love, what's your plan now? Unsure but resolute, I replied. I'm not sure, mom. But one thing's clear, I can't return to that life. Not now, not ever. My declaration, more confident than I anticipated, seemed to echo my newfound determination. My father, who'd been pacing anxiously, paused to reassure me, emphasizing that their support was unwavering regardless of my choice. He reminded me to consider not just my own future, but that of the life growing inside me. His words prompted a silent acknowledgement from me. My mind had been a battlefield of scenarios, each uncertain yet laced with the possibility of a fresh start. The unexpected buzz of my phone broke through my thoughts a message from Peter, a plea for communication. But to me, his timing was a door long closed. His words unseen were left in the void as I turned off my phone, a symbolic end to our dialogue. My next steps were clear, marked by action rather than words. Reaching out to a family lawyer was my first decisive act towards ending the turmoil of my marriage. Supported by my parents, we navigated the cold, legal breakdown of our union, discussing divorce, custody, and financial support. Despite the sterile nature of these discussions, they empowered me, marking the first steps of taking control over my destiny and ensuring the well-being of my unborn child. Within a week, Peter and Julie received the formal notices divorce papers for Peter and an eviction notice for Julie from the home that was legally mine. Included were demands for a substantial child support and compensation for the emotional turmoil I had endured. Though drastic, these actions were necessary, severing the ties that had long bound me to a life of despair. When I finally re-engaged with my phone, it was flooded with Peter's attempts to reach out. His messages conveyed a mix of regret and a desire for reconciliation, but the scars left by nights of humiliation, years of neglect, and Julie's calculated malice, all silently condoned by Peter, were too deep. The brief temptation to hear him out was quickly overshadowed by the memory of the pain endured. This moment wasn't just about ending a chapter. It was about reclaiming my story, one where the shadows of the past no longer dictated the brightness of my future. The love I once felt for him had been completely overshadowed by the sorrow of our failed marriage. I took decisive steps to move on, deleting messages, removing his contact information, and blocking him across all social media. To me, Peter had become just a part of my history, a distressing chapter I was more than ready to conclude. Despite knowing the road ahead would be fraught with its own obstacles, divorce is complicated, even more so with a child on the way I was finally navigating my own life's direction, stepping out from the shadow that had enveloped me towards a future filled with hope. The day of the court proceedings, the room was filled with that distinct, sterile chill characteristic of spaces where fates are decided. My lawyer sat beside me, her posture exuding assurance, while my parents offered silent, steady support from behind. Across the aisle, Peter appeared lost, the reality of the situation dawning on him, while Julie's expression was one of shock and defiance. As the session began, the judge walked in, prompting everyone to rise. The process that followed was a flurry of legal jargon, with accusations and evidence laid bare. It was as if Julie and Peter were seeing their actions for the first time, not just through the legal lens but mine as well. When it came to Julie's turn to speak, her usual confidence was absent. She attempted to justify her actions as concern for her son's welfare, but her explanation fell flat, especially under the judge's skeptical gaze. Judge Nina R. Morrison's verdict was clear and firm. I was granted a full divorce and sole custody of our unborn child. Peter was ordered to provide child support, and Julie, faced with a hefty fine for her emotional abuse and harassment, was visibly shaken. As the judge's gavel fell, a sense of liberation washed over me, 
though it was not without a tinge of sadness. My marriage had concluded not with dramatic confrontations but through the quiet shuffling of papers and the firm voice of justice. This chapter of my life was closed, paving the way for a new beginning, free from the chains of the past. Gaining my freedom came at a price I'd never envisioned on the day I pledged my vows. As we exited the courtroom, Peter approached with a bewildered look, expressing his sorrow and disbelief at how our lives had unraveled. Looking into his eyes, I no longer saw my future, but rather a profound emptiness where love once resided. I never imagined this would be our end, Peter, but apologies can't undo what's been done, I told him, decisively turning away to leave the past behind. Julie sought my gaze, possibly hoping for a sign of forgiveness or recognition, but I couldn't afford her that closure. She had taken too much from me, and I refused to let her see how deeply she had affected my life. Stepping outside, the world seemed to embrace me anew, with the sun shining brighter and colors more vivid. It felt like I was viewing life with a fresh perspective, one not dimmed by the shadows of turmoil. My mother's embrace and words of pride brought tears to my eyes. You're truly free now, Sharon, she said, her emotion evident. I couldn't have faced this without you and Dad, I responded, feeling an immense gratitude for their unwavering support. That evening, in the solitude of my home now solely mine, I felt a deep tranquility. Alone, yet far from lonely, for the first time in a long stretch, I was free to live by my own standards. The path ahead as a single mother seemed daunting, yet as I felt my unborn child's subtle movements, confidence washed over me. We would manage, I was sure of it. The ordeal I had endured led me to this moment of self-discovery. While it left scars, they marked a tale of resilience, not defeat. Facing the future, I was not just compelled by circumstance, but driven by choice. This distinction filled me with a profound sense of empowerment. Ready for what lay ahead, not out of necessity, but from a place of deliberate decision, I knew this was the start of a meaningful new chapter.